in the same box, Zoomcast number two. Hopefully we're getting the hang of this. Uh, I would introduce my co-host right now, uh, but he's since he's not with me, uh, we'll just skip over him. Um, second on the call, also that I wanted to introduce, is Brian Hallman. We've been chatting a little bit uh, before we started recording. Uh, but Brian Hallman uh, was one of our absolutely extraordinary uh, freelance photographers at scene, and I definitely wanted to introduce him because he brought a lot of life to that paper for a lot of years. So, Brian, are you with me? I'm here. All right, man. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate that. Thanks for the kind word. Also, this week, also this week, uh, we have Bobby Hillen on the podcast on the zoom cast and <laughs> Bobby do you want to tell everybody how we met or do I have to um you probably do a better job of it than me but I I, I remember <laughs> it was in Martinsville Speedway is that right <laughs> no oh no before Martinsville no it was before Martinsville uh when I snuck into the garage in Atlanta oh Atlanta that's right yeah, yeah I knew you by the time we were at Martinsville yeah, yeah. I was just yeah yeah, I snuck into the garage in Atlanta, I believe, in November of 1990, and gave Bobby a Bible. So uh, I knew that he was a big, uh, I, I know that he was a man of faith. He was big in MRO, uh, actually one of the founders of MRO. So I uh, snuck in, the, I literally snuck in the garage uh, and by, the, by the security guards and uh, gave him a Bible. So We've known Bob, I've known Bobby for a long time, and Bobby has always been one of the good guys in the sport. Uh, there's not supposed to be any cheering in the press box, but I remember when Bobby relief drove for Davy Allison at Talladega uh, after Davy's really bad accident at Pocono. And you better believe that I was up there in the press box. I wasn't cheering, but I definitely had my fingers crossed for him. So, Bobby, thank you for being one of the good guys. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, cool. Now, what we're going to do with Bobby uh, is uh, you guys can ask him questions. Uh, be Feel free to, to jump in. If you would, please, could you uh, send me a message on the chat? And once I see you on the chat, I will unmute you so you can ask uh, Bobby his question. So, uh, one other person that I wanted to one other person that I wanted to introduce is Jerry Kennan. Uh, Jerry has been in this sport for a long, long time. Jerry was actually uh, Sam Ward's crew chief. Uh, we have the 1983 race that Sam won uh, at Charlotte on our YouTube channel, and Jerry was actually the crew chief. For Sam at that race. And I thought it was so cool when he was on there and we were uh, doing kind of a, a premiere kind of thing. Uh, Jerry said that that was the very first time that um, he had seen that race since that day. So I thought that was pretty cool. Also, Jerry and Bobby worked together. So uh, Jerry, are you, are you with me? Oh, yes, sir. All right, man. Thank you for being here. I wouldn't miss it. All right, cool. Good deal. Um, let's see. I don't believe Steve has joined us yet. So um, does anybody have any questions? Let's see. Let me scroll up here. Um, It looks like Jeff Markoski has a question for uh, Bobby. So, Jeff, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for doing Hi, this again. It's really appreciated and fun. Fire away. Bobby, I actually wrote this down. Uh, how did the, the dynamic of the Stavola Brothers team change when it became a two-car team with Bobby Allison and Miller American coming board, on board? Um, well... It, the team was just getting started, actually. I mean, I had run only, I think, a partial schedule a year before um, Bobby came on board. 
so just you know, the way the whole thing kind of worked with the Stavola brothers was that uh, you know I was just knocking on doors trying to find sponsors. Um, you know how much of the purse do I get? And I said, well, you know, really the way it works is the car owner and the driver split the purse, and 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 uh, I'm the driver and I'm the car owner, so you're the sponsor. You don't really get any of the money. And he said, well, what if I became your car owner? And I said, well, yeah, if you got the car, if you became if you became the car owner, then you would get sixty percent, I would get forty percent. He said, all right, well, how much will you sell me all your equipment for? And I wrote a number down on a piece of paper and I handed it to him. And uh, he took that paper and he, he scratched it out. He wrote another number and he handed it to me. And I looked at it and I said, you got a deal. And so he became my car owner. And the next year we started racing just a few races. And uh, Bobby Allison was having problems with whatever team he was with. And he went to the brothers and said, hey, I can bring a sponsor over. And the Stavola brothers basically said, look, uh, that's great, but only if the sp sponsor will sponsor both you and Bobby Hillen, and uh, which I thought that was, you know, good of them to do that. And I was really big on two-car teams anyway. I liked that. didn't turn out to be the, the way I wanted two-car team to work in terms of information sharing and so forth. But, uh, but at least, uh, it, it, you know, Miller kind of came in and, and became a pretty good size funding for the overall company. And, uh, and uh, you know, you know we, we were off to the races, so to speak, right then. Um, the, the the team it really wasn't like a two car team. Was, they kind of had their team, we had our team, and and uh, the, you know unfortunately that's the way it was at the time. The mindset you know of two car teams really didn't improve until Rick Hendrick came in and started his his multi car team, and and I think that's what really started changing the dynamics of two car teams in the sport. But uh, so I didn't really get to take advantage of that. So there really wasn't a lot of information being shared between both teams. It was just you're over here and you're over here and we'll go our separate ways and meet at the racetrack? Uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't supposed to be that way, but it, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, um, it was tough to say the least for me. Um, but, but, uh, you know, but it's, you know, but still there was, you know, probably learned some things and, and, uh, and so that was, that was good. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. Unmute your mic, Rick. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. he, he'll take the wrong chastain. He was thinking hard. That's fine. If you guys want to take a few moments, you don't have to. How about now? All right, cool. Uh, listen, my chat got erased somehow. I clicked out of the window. So if you do have a question for Bobby, uh, please type it again and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, we did have a question from Zach Gillespie. So Zach. Fire away, Zach. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, couldn't get the mute off. Uh, thanks, Bobby, for joining us. I just have a question. Uh, I was going back through some of your stats, and in 1992, you drove for probably one of the most obscure teams in NASCAR, um, a team from Ireland. What was it like having a uh, an international car owner? I know that it's happened before. I was just curious about, you know, that was a pretty obscure team. What was that like? Um, actually, it was, it was pretty good just from a standpoint of uh, I really got to be uh, friends with the car owner, uh, and his name was Martin Brain. Martin went on after his NASCAR venture to to purchase Lola cars, Lola chassis, and uh, so he was he was he had he had his fingers in a lot of things throughout motorsports in general. And um, Martin was a tough negotiator, but we were we were on the same team, and uh, and he did the best he could do to 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 be a car owner who would fly in literally on the weekend from overseas to, to come to a NASCAR race. And he really loved it. Um, we were trying to build a team and get good people. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but we had uh, an engine program from Richard Childress Engines. And they, they gave us really good engines. And um, we, we, were, we were starting to get more and more competitive. Um, but we, we got penalized heavily after the race at Charlotte. Um, and it was one of those cases where NASCAR uh, was trying to set a, 
they were trying to set kind of a, a boundary for all the teams and they used Martin Brain as an example. And because of that, uh, I think we got unjustly uh, penalized and Martin just said, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend this money to do this, to get treated like this. And he left NASCAR. And that was a shame because he could have been, I think Martin could have been a long time uh, top team had, uh, had things just played out a little bit differently for him within NASCAR. Hey, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I, I believe Seth Sharp has a question. So what was it like being associated with Mark McGuire during his home run chase and kind of working with all those other players involved in general? Okay. Well, well, Bobby, Bobby, before you start, you have a really cool Mark McGuire helmet that you're evidently determined to keep. <laughs> well, okay. So y'all were talking, y'all were talking earlier about about where you are in your office and stuff. I'm I'm at my home in Austin, and I don't really keep that much racing stuff. But I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the thing around here. I'll show you this oh. is something that I did keep here, and I'll let you see it in the background. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's my. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, just to answer your question, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Mark was a great guy. Um, and uh, the other players were also super, super great players. I, I became lifelong friends with Danny Schaefer and Gary Gaetti, um, and still are to this day. So it was a great experience. And those guys were true NASCAR fans. And, and um, Mark was new to NASCAR, but he, he certainly enjoyed it and loved it. And uh, it's just um, it's, it's a good kind of a good good thing for us all together. And and uh, I enjoyed going to baseball games. And I specifically remember sitting at a game after a couple of the guys retired, going to see either Mark McGuire or somebody play, and to watch two professional baseball players talk about a baseball game while it's going on was fascinating to me because they see things and they know things that are going on that that you or I'll just never understand. And so it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Thanks for explaining that all. Yeah, no problem. Hey, hey, if you can still hear me, um, I want to just say that we got Jerry Kennan on the line and, and, and I appreciate Jerry coming on the show. Jerry is one of my all time favorites and, and Jerry really helped save my career at one point um, because he was our crew chief when I first started the, the Bush team back in uh, 80, 87 or 89, I can't remember what year it was, 88. And uh, and Jerry and Todd Bodine and John Monson were on my team and uh, they built me some really, really fast race cars and we ran up front all the time and won a couple races. And so uh, I think it's exciting that Jerry's on the on the call today. And and uh, and although I don't see him that often and, and it, it didn't even get to see him that much in the later part of my career, uh, you know, he's one of my favorite memories and favorite friends from uh, – from all of my years racing. So I just want to say that to Jerry and tell him how much I love him and appreciate him. Thank you. You saved my life a couple of times too. <laughs> I don't know about that, but we had a lot of fun. That's for sure. Oh yeah, we definitely had a lot of fun. A lot of work. I almost, I almost, if I recall, I almost killed you one time driving the, tr driving the trailer up to the wind tunnel in Detroit. Yes, yep. I started to get over there with you and help you steer. <laughs> we did good That's though. That's great. All right. I believe that Josh. I believe that Josh Ward has a question. Josh. Thanks, Rick. Hi, Bobby. I have a question. What was it like after you ran the full season in '93, and then in '94 it looked like you ran a partial season with Hardy Racing? How did that deal come together? It seemed like they were a short-lived team. Well. Um... You know, listen, at my age, and, and I've hit the wall so many times, a lot of that stuff kind of comes as a blur. But, uh, uh, you know, really, um, I remember how the Hardy thing came about, and that was, uh, I was I was going through a really rough period with, uh, I had kind of gotten going with Dick Moroso, and um, if, I, if I'm correct on my timelines on all this stuff, and we were struggling pretty bad, and, and, you know, that thing fell apart. And so I was really not doing much. 
and Bill Elliott was, was driving for Junior Johnson and he partnered with Hardy um, because that was going to be a kind of a R and D year to get that team up and running uh, prior to Bill coming over and starting his own team again with Hardy. And so um, uh, Bill fortunately asked me to come and, and do some races for them and ended up being five or six races. And, and so uh, we had one really cool experience at the Brickyard and we had some other good stuff. It was, it was a lot of testing and, and, uh, and kind of some R&D races for those guys. But that, that's what it was really all about was it was kind of a, a preseason for Bill to come over and start his own team. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, next up, it looks like we have a question from Matt Miles. Matt? Yes, sir. Oh. Fire, fire away. <laughs> All right. Hey, no thunderstorm today. I'm glad to be on this week's uh, <laughs> instead of getting kicked off. So I, I appreciate you inviting me back. A uh, question uh, relating for both uh, Bobby and Jerry, um, kind of old school, new school. We've got this interesting cup and uh, truck and Xfinity schedule coming up with some Wednesday night races. And I'm just curious to see how you guys would go ahead and, and sort of prep for something like that as a driver, as a crew chief. And, um, you know, kind of kind of talk about maybe uh, what you guys would do in such a situation uh, kind of going forward. It looks like we may we may have this for the rest of 2020. So just looking for your thoughts on on how you guys would prep for these weeknight races. I, I, from a stand, fan standpoint, I think these are going to be great. Grab a couple of beers and a bag of pretzels. We're going to have us a show, you know. So, <laughs> well, I think I think Jerry Jerry needs to answer that question probably before I do because he's he's more recent with the sport and and uh, so let's let Jerry take that one. I appreciate it. Well, most of it is is if they don't have any qualifying or practice, a lot of the teams would be just take one one vehicle because then you'd have the next one ready for the next race. And I I think it's a good deal. It's gonna it's definitely going to throw a curve in it. I mean, start in Darlington, think about some of those rookies that's never been around there other than in being in a sim program. I mean, like uh, William Byron and them, no, and no rubber on the racetrack. I love it. Um, who can slide the best? That was a quote from Mark Martin, and that's, that's what's going to happen. So about any place they go, Charlotte, even for the truck deal, they're just going to – I think they're going to line them up how they uh, – they're talking about lining those cars up like – trucks up like they finished the race at Vegas and and you know or how they entered or something like that they hadn't come right out and said it but the cup deal if they don't have qualifying I think it I think it's good no practice I they're supposed to be professionals I mean just get in there and flip the switch up all right good deal our next question comes from Buddy Rushing. Buddy? Hey, uh, thanks for joining us, Bobby. Uh, I just wanted to ask, at different points in your career, you had an opportunity to work with one of the, I think, one of the true legends of the sport in Harry Hyde. Uh, what was it like to work with sort of an old school crew chief like that when you were coming up? Um, you know, I'll tell you something. Harry, Harry is just a legend in the sport. And um, uh, I, I, I just, uh, man, I couldn't have, couldn't have been more fortunate to have somebody to start me out, you know, driving with, Harry, driving with Harry and driving for Harry. And, you know, it probably wasn't until later in my career that I appreciated really how much head and shoulders above everyone else he was. Um, the, I worked with him on two occasions. On the first occasion is when I first got into the sport and got started before Rick Hayden retired him. And, um, you know, I think back, we, we, he built a car for us to race five short track races. And one thing led to another. We raced North Wilkesboro, and then we went to Pocono, and then we went to Michigan, then we went to Daytona, and then we went to Talladega with a short track car. So we ran one short track and four speedways. And, and, uh, and Harry, you know, he taught me how to drive the cars. He taught me what to look for the field. Um, and I only wish I could have stuck with Harry for a consistent period of time you know, when we got started over the Stavola brothers, because because I think we could have done a lot better. The, the, the only downturn of working with Harry was that when radial tires came about, Harry had come back and started working with me at Stavola's the, the first year radial tires came into play. 
And 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 the first and you're you're probably too young to remember this, but the first couple of years that we raced radial tires, they weren't like they are today. They were very very unforgiving. And um, Goodyear was going through a huge learning curve, as were the teams and the crew chiefs and everyone. And so there was just a lot of collaboration about what to what to do to the cars, and 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 literally. You know the the teams were having to take away front grip because the you know the, the drivers were going in and the car would point and back of the car would spin out and uh, they were trying to take away as much front grip as possible to keep the cars from just you know just busting loose on you and um, Harry really struggled with that and and a lot of his frustrations were you know geared towards me and you know we ended up just kind of not really having a very good ending to that last year that we raced together and unfortunately for Harry he was kind of starting to you know, he's starting, he was kind of on the tail end of his career. And, and so, you know, I just kind of think about, you know, the, the early part of the, my time with Harry because he was so smart and he was so witty. And I mean, I, I, I can't say enough good things about Harry and just what all he taught me. And it just, it was, you know, it was just a, it was just a, a great time. And, and man, he was just, I mean, you know, I'll tell you back in the seventies and all the way, I think all the way through the, about through mid 80 through about 85 I don't think there was anybody any smarter in the garage area than Harry Hyde and I think there are a lot of people that will, that will second that motion thank you I think Jerry was going to say something about Harry Jerry you definitely could learn something from him and Tommy uh they were uh, we'd go to lunch and Bobby he'd take us He'd go to lunch with us sometimes when I was doing the bush deal. And he always he always had a story and and some wisdom. If you if you sat there and listened to him, you would learn a lot from him. He he was a smart man, real smart. I was I was glad to be part of even being around him. All right, cool. Uh, next up, we have a question from Brian Hallman and Bobby. Uh, I don't know if you remember Brian, but Brian was a scene photographer, and you know how those scene photographers were. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I'm going to apologize in advance if he if he says anything uh, that that might get spun out a little bit. So, that's okay. I, I don't. I mean, he looks familiar, but were you a photographer when I was raising? Yes. Yes. I absolutely. Wow, you look too young, but that's okay. That's cool. Oh, come on. <laughs> I was at your first race at Wilkesboro as a 19 year old. Oh wow! So I got to see I got to see your first start. I was actually 17. Yep. And so, um, man, that's kind of what I wanted to ask about. Um, you came in as a 17 year old and coming in at you know 19 or so, but they have two years of experience in either trucks or Xfinity bush cars. You went straight into a cup car. Do you think it would have made any difference if you'd have, you know, run some Bush Series races and get some experience on the bigger tracks before you jumped into it? Listen, um, there are a lot of things looking back that obviously hurt, you know, hurt my career. A, coming in early as I did, and B, winning as early as I did. And so, you know, obviously, if I had it to do all over again, you know, I, I would – I would have taken the route of running the, the, at the time it was, I think it was called the Grand National Series or, or, or something, but um, I would have taken the time to do that and, and work up. But it was unusual circumstances in that, in that my, my grandfather kind of helped me get started. And he basically said, I got one year or just, just a limited amount of money and then that's it. And so we knew that I wasn't going to, you know, I didn't gonna have anybody that was going to take me through the ranks. And he ended up actually going bankrupt the very next year. And so my family was kind of broke, um, you know, that, like the very next year after I ran those first five races. My, both my dad, my granddad, the, the family was just both broke. So they didn't have any more money. And so, and it was unusual because we met Harry Hyde when I was at the Buck Baker Driving School. And Harry was at a, out of a job at the time, very controversial situation back with J.D. Stacy, and, <laughs> and so Harry was looking for a job and he said, hey, I can build little Bobby a car and, and we could race in these cup races. 
And that's how he can get some notoriety and get some sponsorship. And so that's what we did. And he did it on a really, really low budget. And um, so we didn't really have any choice but to try to go that route. Um, and it was working well probably up until the second year of the Stavola Brothers. The first year of the Stavola Brothers went really well. We won a race. And then the second year, the Stavola Brothers, at least on my side, they tried to start building their own chassis and doing their own things. And, you know, the team just got lost. I got lost. We all got lost. And that's why, again, it was so so important for me to start the Bush team with Jerry Kennan and Todd Bodine and, and uh, John Monsum and, and uh, you know, Glenn Feist was doing the motors. And, and, and that's what allowed me to go back and win some more races and run up front. But, but realistically, you're right. I should have, I should have you know, started in the Bush series and, and, and run some more years in that before ever getting into cup. But I didn't really have a choice how that was going to happen. Well, did the, um, was the car up here or was it in Texas? Oh, no, everything was in, in North Carolina. I, I moved to North Carolina and lived there during the summer between 11th and 12th grade of high school. Okay. That's when I ran the first five races with Harry Hyde. I came back as soon as we finished Talladega. I came back, started my senior year of high school, played football. When football was over, my dad said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to race NASCAR. He said, well, there's no NASCAR in Texas. What are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to move to North Carolina as soon as I graduate. He said, why are you going to wait till you graduate? I said, well, can I move up there now? He said, as far as I'm concerned, you can. So I moved up to North Carolina between halfway through my senior year, and, and I lived there for the next 18 and a half years. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Bobby, how are you doing on time? Uh, I'm fine. I, I'm, I'm just chilling out. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Kevin McKenzie. Kevin? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, how do you think uh, my Snickers racing team hat has held up over 30 years? It looks good. It looks That's pretty good, cool, isn't it? <laughs> looks good. Uh, Rick, I've got a quick question for you before I've got one for Bobby. Uh -oh. um, what What is the uh, fall 1989 North Wilkesboro race typically remembered for? The fall 1989 North Wilkesboro race? Yeah, what, what do most people remember it for? Well, the first thing I would think about is Ricky Rudd and Dale Earnhardt. Yeah, so you know that, that's what most people remember. Uh, but for me, uh, it was the day that I got to meet Bobby Hill and my hero. Ah. Uh, so <laughs> that's the day I got to meet him and got this autograph. So, uh, Bobby, first of all, I want to apologize. If you were wanting to watch some of the fight, I probably interrupted that by trying to get your autograph. <laughs> No, no problem. No problem. Thank you. Uh, so, Bobby, the question I have for you is that uh, a lot of people um, will differentiate their highest performance years and their most enjoyable years. They're not necessarily the same time. Uh, and I was wondering for you, if you look back at your career, even pre-NASCAR, what would you say your most enjoyable times were in racing just from a pure passion for the sport? Well, I'm, I'm not just saying this because Jerry Kennan's on the call, but I will tell you, it was, it was, a, it was a two and a half years that we all did the Bush car together. Um, and the reason is because, you know, I was struggling so bad on the cup side and, you know, I'd go get her on the Bush car and we'd run up front. And, and um, I mean, we, even though we only won one race one year and one race the next year, we really ran up front and should have won more races. And, and we were very competitive and, and we just loved working together. It was, it was the coolest thing about it is, you know, I would go over there and, and work with the guys in the shop. And e even though I wasn't really a fabricator or anything, I, I was working and doing stuff and, and uh, spending time with the guys. We'd go to lunch together. Um, we, like I say, we drove the truck to the wind tunnel together and just I almost killed them driving in the snow. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, we just had a great, great time. And, and, and you know, we were just competitive. And, and uh, it was probably my – it was probably my most enjoyable years of racing. It was just that two and a half years we did the Bush car, you know, to, towards the end of my Stavola brothers career. Uh, well, thank now, you very much, Bobby. Pleasure to, to get to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Bobby, that two and a half years that you drove that, that car with, with Jerry Cannon and John Monson, that was just a little bit before I arrived on the scene. So your most enjoyable years were before I got there. 
<laughs> I love to say, partner. Come <laughs> on, man. You you know how to hurt a guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. All right, let's see. Next up, we have a question from Hallie. We have a question from Hallie Emery. Hallie, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Rick. Thanks Hi, again man. for doing this this week. All right, no problem, man. Um, quick question for you, Bobby. And this question actually comes from a friend of mine, Jay Coker, who couldn't be here uh, this evening. But he was wanting to know, uh, with Stavola Brothers being with Buick for such a long period of time and, and Chevy and Ford um, winning a lot of the races at the time, uh, did did the Stavola brothers consider switching manufacturers during this time, uh, given the lack of success Buick was having in 88 and 89? Um, you know, I don't remember, I don't remember talk of us switching too much. Um, you know, back then, uh, I think it's when the, they started having the, the, the back of the cars went from being what they call a notch back, you know, to a mm -hmm. slope back where you had more more downforce on the back, and so w whether we were in the Buick or the or the Chevy or whatever, everybody had a lot of downforce on the back. You know, I guess none of this downforce is compared to what we, we have today. But but from from the, what they had years prior, there's a lot of downforce in the back, and so the problem was trying to get the cars to turn um, because there's so much downforce in the back, you just couldn't get the front to point. And um, I can remember with the Buick. We had a, we had, uh, you know, the, you, 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 the race teams worked with the manufacturers to come up with these valence or what you're kind of like what they have splitters today, the very bottom portion of the nose. And we had one uh, for the Buick that we had tested. It worked pretty well. And we, we were pretty fast with it. And the other teams complained and they said, you shouldn't let them run that front valence. And so we went, we had to put this, just this stock front valence on the car to go to Daytona. And I, I am not kidding you. I literally remember driving down pit road, going up the speed, down the back straightaway, going through turns three and four and getting in the tri-oval and turn the steering wheel and the front end, not even turn the car, still going straight to the wall and back out of the gas real quick and the front dove and I, you know, almost crashed and just came in and said, wow, man, that's scary. And so, you know, other drivers that were driving Buicks immediately came in and had the same problem. So NASCAR allowed us to go to that, that front end, um, which once we learned the balance of the car with that, it was really, that, that, that style of Buick was really pretty good. Um, this is, now I'm going back, now I'm really going back to, you know, I, I can't remember when they let us, but it, 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 all these different changes, it turns out to be a pretty good front end. And we ended up getting the balance. I, I don't really remember Buick, being a disadvantage, although, you know, you didn't really know. I mean, when I go, when I think back on my racing career and think about one disadvantage to another, the biggest thing I remember was the first time I ever sat in Robert Yates' car and thought, <laughs> man, I've been a disadvantage no matter whose car I was in. That thing was a rocket ship and it drove like a Cadillac. So, I mean, it was great. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, it looks like we have a question next from uh, Eric G. Hold on just a second. Let me get you. Eric, are you with us? Okay, try again. Right there. All right, Allie. Uh, I'm sorry, Eric, go ahead. All right, yeah, Bobby, I just want to. Um, Go back to your Winston Cup win at Talladega and just ask what was kind of going through your mind those last few laps. Like, was it all nervous or did you say, if I just keep my, keep going the way I'm going, I got this thing uh, shirt up? Well, you know, no, I think it was more, um, it was just more like, okay, I got to keep these guys behind me no matter what. I mean, that's all I really remember is I got to keep these guys behind me no matter what. And, um, <laughs> You know, it's funny because you think back about back in those days, you know, what we did, and we didn't really block like they block today. I mean, you couldn't – if I'd have put a block on those guys back then like these guys block today, oh, I, I'd have been the – the, the, they'd have run me out of town. 
And, and I mean, nobody, you know, you, you just couldn't do that. Today, it's just like standard practice to do the kind of blocking they did. But one thing that was interesting about that race is that, uh, you know, I got, I got accused of crashing Harry Gant, you know, 10 laps or 15 laps prior to that. But the fact of the matter is, we were literally just drafting tight and his back of his car just came off off the ground and landed on my nose because I could, I could see the smoke and hear his tire spin, you know, as he, he just kind of came up and landed on my car. Well, I obviously wasn't going to get out of the gas, but, uh, but um, you know, stuff like that was kind of, it was maybe the beginning of when all this crazy kind of racing started. But uh, I just mainly just remember, gosh, just keep them behind me. Just whatever mm -hmm. takes them behind me. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate uh, it. Hey, Eric? Yes. Um, I got to ask. I, I was yep. kind of afraid to try your last name. How do you pronounce <laughs> your last name? I know. It's a doozy. It's Gissen Danner. Well, okay. I'm glad I didn't give it a shot. <laughs> 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 because I don't believe I would have been close. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. All right. Bob Ellis, do you have a question? Well, Eric uh, Eric kind of covered it, but so I'll, I'll go a different route. Uh, Bobby, tell us about Nazareth being two laps down and still winning. Um, gosh, I don't remember if we were two laps down, but I know we definitely lost a lap because two. we changed from – Hoosiers to Goodyear's, and um, that was just an unbelievable fun race. I mean, it, it was just it was just uh, a lot of fun. And I remember we were really fast. I remember after we got the lap down and we we got back on the lead lap, but we weren't leading. I think during that time we pitted, and we pitted and got gas, and and then and and um, Jerry can probably tell this better. But the long and short of it is, the other guys didn't pit. And so we were, when we, when they didn't pit, we got behind and I was just racing my tail off. And I think I'd gotten back up to maybe third and, and Jerry was telling me on the radio, I was really pushing hard, pushing hard. He said, don't, don't worry. These guys, there's no way they can make it. You're really effectively, you're the leader when these guys pit. And um, sure enough, that's what happened. We won the race. And uh, there's a little more backstory to that with the tires we got from Earnhardt. Um, but Jerry, if you want to speak up to that race, you know, go right ahead. Well, that was when the tire war was going on with Hoosier and Goodyear, and we went to Nazareth, and we were so fast on Hoosiers, and we qualified on outside pole, and I think it don't matter how many times we put them on in practice on the 13th lap, the right rear would blow out. It, they were just burning them up, and uh, so we were just going to take our lumps, and the, the deal was if you switch manufacturers during the race, you took a two-lap penalty. Well, Earnhardt was there. And I've had past, I've raced against him with Sam and everybody back in the day. And uh, he had, I don't know if he had engine trouble or crashed or something. Well, during the race, somebody taps me on the shoulder and it's Dale and he goes, hey, he goes, take them tires off of that car, put these on it and you can win this race. I said, it's two lap penalty. He goes, just do it. And they just piled all the good years in there. I mean, not knowing at the time, because we didn't have time to think about it, but they were smaller. So when we put them on, we was running V6. Well, it was screaming, that thing. We took the two-lap penalty, made one of them up under a caution. But the second one, Rick Mass was leading, and we passed him and stayed in front of him a whole fuel run. And then the caution came out, and we got the second lap back, and then it was over after that. <laughs> and then I asked Dale. I got in contact with him when he came back home, and he's, I said, what about them tires? He goes, I, I don't know what you're talking about, them tires. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> all good so in, a, in other words he didn't make us buy the tire right yeah right. And, and, I, and i'll and i'll tell you the other side story the back story to that the next week we were racing in charlotte and we blew an engine <clears throat> and the interesting thing about that race is that the cup teams and the bush teams were running the same exact tires and there was a shortage of tires that particular week. Yeah. And no sooner did I did I got off the radio, or then did we blow up? I came on the radio and said, "Hey, take our extra tires down to the Stavola brothers team." And one of my partners, um, it was either T Felix or Ted Condor. A lot of people don't know, but Ted Condor and Felix were partners when they started Sabco Racing. But one of those guys came on the radio and said, "No, no." take them down to the 42 cup team because by then they had started a cup team with Kyle Petty 
take him down the 42 cup team. No sooner did they say that, Jerry Kennan comes on the radio and says, no, we're giving them to Earnhardt because they gave us the tires last week to, to, that we won the race on. So the three of us are fighting on the radio about where to take the tires. And uh, I think ultimately, Jerry, Ollie, you won that argument, didn't you? Did you go oh, yeah. to Earnhardt or did you go to the 42 car? They went to, they went to Earnhardt. They went to Earnhardt. Okay. Yep. So anyway, that was the beginning of the end of my partnership with Felix Sabatis and Ted Condor. I walked in Felix's office the next day and said, I want you to buy me out because I don't like all this. And they bought me out. I ran a, a handful of races after that for them. And then Kyle started driving. But that was the way that, that was the way that, that was the way that, that team actually ended for, as far as I was concerned. Wow. Thank you very much. That's, that's some really good uh, stories and background information. Yeah. All right, Bob. Thank you, man. No problem. All right. Our next question comes from Edwin Turner. Edwin? Hey. Um, Bobby, I'm going to change the way I'm going to ask this question. Originally, well, originally I was going to ask, you have uh, some good stories from your days with Jeannie Dunleavy, but let's see. Boop, boop, boop. Do this thing backwards here. So hopefully you have some good memories and not that you can share with us on those days. I know you were there just a kind of a short time, one season. But yeah, what can you me, share? Yeah, well, I'll tell you something. It was, you know, it, it, it was really cool driving for Junie because he was so, such a historic figure in the garage area. And everybody loved Junie. And I learned, you know, once I was driving for Junie, why everybody loved him. He was such a great guy. And, um, and you know, he, he is a matter of fact, um, it's, it's, this is the kind of guy Junie was. He said, we were, when we first, before we ever raced the first race, um, there was, you know, lawyers involved on the contracts and all this stuff and, and it wasn't turning out right. And they, and, and I just said something to Junie, I said, well, Junie, you're saying this and these lawyers are saying this. And, and, and he just said, look, Bobby, you know, we don't even need it. Don't even worry about it. You can drive here as long as you want to drive for me and period. And don't worry about that. And if you don't want to drive for me, you don't have to. And, and, and that's the agreement we had. And it worked out great. And, and effectively, I did end up leaving during this, like the second or third year. I can't remember. But um, Junie was just such an unbelievably great guy. And, uh, and we had just, we had a good time together. Um, unfortunately, you know, the sport was just going through so much change. And it was just hard up in, in Richmond for, uh, for, for the family team, so to speak to really kind of keep up with what was going on. And, and I was making a real push to get them to move the team down to North Carolina and get, get or at least get more of the work done in North Carolina. And, um, and they just weren't ready to do that. And, and so we kind of had an amicable split. But, uh, but you know, I, I have some fun stories. I mean, one time he has a young, young kid, younger than me working on the team. And uh, one of the first weekends I was there to, to, you know, meet him and do different things. It was dark out, and this kid had really, really long hair. And we started talking, and we agreed to have a foot race. And and uh, if I beat him in the foot race, he was gonna have to cut his hair. <laughs> and uh, and so we're in, it's a dark, and we're running from one parking lot to another, and we have to run across a street. And the street it was one of those crown streets where it was high in the center and you know low on both sides, and we were running dead across it perpendicular in the dark and that street had just been re asphalted and tarred with fresh gravel. And I got going down that hill so fast, my legs got out from under me. I, I planted, put my foot down and it looked like you would just taken a fork and just stuck it in my hand and just got a big chunk out. And Junie had to spend the next three hours in the emergency room with me, getting my hand all sewed up. And, th and that was how we got to know each other so good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Edwin, thank you, man. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, looks like Josh Ward has a question for Jerry Kennan. Yeah, Jerry, what's, what was it like working with the NEMA checks, both Joe and John? And how different or how alike are they? Well, uh, I actually still work for them. Uh, just getting over to the shenanigans we're going through here in 
COVID thing, but um, the how are you asking how I got it or no? Just just what what is it like? Because it's kind of a unique situation that probably yeah. not many people have been through. Well, uh, the difference, like if you had a son and you're Joe Nemechek and you tell your son who's trying to drive something nine times out of ten they going you're still their dad they're going they're going to do it their way it don't matter so where i came in what and i lived it too with my son racing go-karts but if i would tell john hunter the same thing that joe would he would listen just because <laughs> i had the experience you know and i'm not his dad like i went to the first test at dover with them and uh they're way different because this is a way it, it kind of looks to me when you're his age, you're worried about winning. You're not worried about paying for it. You're up on the wheel trying to win every practice, every lap. Joe's out there. He's got enough experience. And plus, I, I've seen him hurt himself two or three times, not by his fault all the time, but those walls are hard, aren't they, Bobby? So oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he drives smart, but now, now I've seen – John Hunter take a different turn for that. He's learned a lot more. And I, I preach to him all the time when I work with him, you know, patience, 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 take it easy. And I think he's come around to that. He's learned so much to be his age. He was so far ahead, I thought, for his age anyway. Because of them, they ran those uh, Allison Legacy cars. And they would go test, and John Hunter had one, and Joe had one, and he put used tires on John Hunter, and Joe would start on new tires and just wear each other out. And it made him a better race car driver, I think, t tire management and stuff wise. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think you're spot on to see the performance John Hunter had in the in the uh, front row car last year. And then the first couple of races this year, I mean, he, he kind of bumped that car up five, maybe even 10 spots at times yeah, with no correct. experience in a cup car. Yeah, even like when he drove the Super, we went, you know, we lost a race, the Snowflake down there in 13 and 14 rather and after the race is over like five in the morning i said you learn anything because i was spotting for him and he goes yeah and i said well just listen and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll win and we did and he's just got a lot of confidence you know and this family on deal and, and i i'm all about it and like bobby his family's was great to work with and you know and he was too and uh the he just you know he was from texas and I used to ride him about it all the time. And I got my Texas hat on from some friends of mine down there now. But uh, I, I miss him being at the racetrack. I really do. Bobby. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. And I work for a Texas company. All right. Colorado. Cool. <laughs> hey, hey uh, uh, am I on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Hey, I was going to tell, I think it was Edwin that I was talking to a minute ago about Junie. He was asking for some good memories. Is that yeah. right? Is yeah. That yes. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, yes. I, I almost I almost forgot this. Probably my the most exciting time was we literally should have won the Daytona 500. I think it was 19, whatever year it was, the year that, that Kyle Petty and I got into it on the grass. Because that year we with Junie, we had the fastest car at Daytona. We had the fastest car in testing. We had the fastest car in the race. We literally should have won that race. I was the only, people don't realize, I was the only Ford. At that time, Chevrolets were dominating on the speedways. I was the only Ford that passed Dale Earnhardt for, under the green conditions for the lead in the Daytona 500 that year. And through a series of pit stops and getting behind, you know, we were in that situation where uh, Al Jr. and Dale got together. I think Al Jr. tried to cut Dale off on the high side, and they came together, crashed into me. And we ended up crashing. But all during that practice and testing, we were so fast. And, and Robert Yates was giving us engines. And, you know, they were looking at the car. Everybody was looking at the car trying to figure out how fat, why it was so fast. And I don't know to this day if they ever figured out why it was so fast. But the car was just unbelievably fast. And that was just a good, fun, you know, few weeks of testing and all the way up through the race, all the way up through until we got taken out, thinking, man, we should have won that race. Well, Bobby, I think somebody else had a question I was reading. Can you follow up on uh, your side of the story with uh, you and Kyle? Well, I've told this n numerous times. Yeah. You know, the, the bottom line is this. You know, Kyle was 
further behind when the caution came out and everybody had slowed down and what Kyle just didn't remember was that the the when you're and this is one of the things about driving speedway and maybe driving for tuning you know they had a single master cylinder in the car so if, if when you when somebody comes across your front end and rips your wheel off and you got your foot on the brake you push all the brake fluid out because you only have one master cylinder so you don't have any rear brakes you don't have any front brakes you don't have any steering you're just along for the ride so obviously i go through the infield and back up through the track Kyle felt like I let off the brake, and that's why I slid up on the track. So when I'm sitting up against the wall, Kyle crawls across his roof, and I'm thinking he's going to say, hey, man, are you okay? That's normally kind of like the protocol. And instead, he says, why don't you keep your blankety blank foot off the, on the brake? And I thought, I sat there for a minute. I'm like, wait a minute. What did he just say to me? I said, no, I'm going to go explain this to him. So then I go down, chase him down, and we get into this rah-rah. And you know, maybe maybe I should have just gone ahead. And, we should have just gone ahead and gotten a fight. It would have been a better deal. But the bottom line is it's all over. And what people don't really realize, Kyle wrote me an awesome apology, handwritten apology note that's very much appreciated. And you know, I think Kyle looks back and laughs at the story. He didn't tell it the same way I tell it, but I can look back and laugh at the story and tell you, you know what I could say is the true version of the story. Well, I think we've heard his side a whole lot more than yours, so that's why I ask again. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I, and I, I mean, we, you know, he's got the opportunity to tell it a lot more, too, so I, I don't worry about that. It's all fun. It's all yeah. good. All right, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. I think the only other person that has not asked a question yet, um, Fred Petke. Are you with yeah. us? All right, fire yes. away. Um, Fred? You um, touch on on this a, a little bit talk, talking about talking about um, racing for um, Junie Don and um, Le Levy. Um, but um, what what is the you know what what are what are the and the differences between racing for a and Charlotte based team and one that's that's based at our our hours hours up the road um you know I'm not a total expert at telling you what these differences are um, I can only assume from what I thought in, in conversations with other people, but, you know, there was a joke that if one team offered a mechanic 50 cents more, you know, he'd go roll his toolbox over to the other shop. And that was the bad part about all the shops being, uh, you know, aggregated right there around, the, the, you know, Mooresville area. But the, the other side of it is the fact, I mean, the, the, you know, the fact is there's just very few secrets in racing. And, and, you know, probably today there's more secrets and people are, it's become such big business that, you know, there's, there's probably a lot more uh, privacy and, and requirements that the mechanics and the team owners and the engineers or you know, all the people are required to have. But, but back when we were racing, you know, when, when one group was doing something, they found something, it really didn't take that long to get that out amongst the other teams. Hey, they're doing this, they're doing that. You know, Harry Gant, when he won all those races, had a cambered rear end. They kept that secret long enough to win, you know, five or six races, I can't remember, you know, in a row or seven out of, you know, eight, I can't remember what it was. They won like five or out of seven races or something. And that was probably one of the longest kept secrets that anybody had for a while. But, but um, you know, the thing is when you're not there, or back then at least when you're not located there, um, you just don't, here okay what's going on you know this helps that helps do this do that whether it's the car the chassis the engine the tires you know jerry can probably elaborate on that too but you just you're just not in the know quite as fast there's only a lot now uh, the secrets are not as you know you don't hand them out but uh the saying was that you only had a, a trick for two weeks and then somebody else would tell it you know or you see, it's, it's a lot of it's monkey see, monkey do anyway, because 
you watch and see what other people do and you, it doesn't take long. You can, you see the noticeable differences in their cars and then you build something like it. Or on my case, I usually try to build something better and then I end up in a trailer with Bobby sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, let's see. I think, I think that's it for all the questions that, that everybody has asked individually. I think we had some other people wanting to ask some follow-up. Uh, Bobby, would you have time for a couple more follow-ups or? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. I got just a few more minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see. Matt Miles, go ahead. All right, yes, sir. Uh, Bobby, just a real quick one. Um, what would you say your favorite track to drive on is? I know it's that cliche question, but, you know, I love hearing drivers kind of talk about what you like, um, you know, the, the technical nuances and the fine points of, uh, you know, wherever it was, whatever series, doesn't matter. What was your favorite track that you enjoyed driving on the most? Yeah, um, I, I'll put it like this. No matter what, I always, always love Bristol and Darlington, and then I would say uh, Watkins Glen, those three probably. Um, before restrictor plates, I really loved Daytona and Talladega both. And the reason is because the cars were going faster and faster and faster, and it just this, it was just this crazy feeling of you know knowing that you got to hold it wide open and you're pushing the limits and just what you could do to hold it wide open and what you know it was a really ch a challenge and you know they kind of the restrictor plates killed all that you know Al although they ended up you know making the cars pretty edgy even with the restrictor plates but it was a different kind of edgy so to speak um versus just a pure speed you know where you're just you know hauling the mail down in the corner um, on some old guys fly tires you know <laughs> yeah I, I remember as a matter of fact the, the year that i won was the last year before restrictor place and and, I th and 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 they had a radar gun on me and bill elliott drafting in practice at 213 miles an hour in the car you know if you just think about what that would be today without restrictor place it's crazy but so i just so you know pre-restrictor place i enjoy this tracks but all together, I'd say Bristol, Darlington, and Watkins. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Hallie Emery, uh, I believe you're. Yes, I'm here, Rick. All right, go ahead. I believe you're going to be the last question there, bud. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rick. Uh, Bobby, in 1984 and 85, uh, when you were running with the Stavola team, in 1984, I know you ran – most of the races you didn't run all of them in 85 you did run the full schedule but there seemed to be a performance increase increase of the team in 1985 and i was wondering what the components were that made the performance of the team so much better in 85 than in 84. i guess you're right because i was thinking that i didn't run the full season until 86 but but you're right we did run a full season in 85. um yeah i mean really it was just really a matter of Get, getting people on the team, getting, you know, mechanics and, and, and all the right team put together. I mean, look, I didn't know shoot from Shinola when I got there and the Stavola brothers were looking at me to hire the people. I'm, I mean, look, I'm an 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid, whatever at the time. And I'm trying to hire the people. And I, I didn't know that many people myself. I didn't even know my way around town very well. And I'm trying to pull these people together and get this team going. So it was really just a matter of, over time trying to put the people together um, to come in and build the cars and, and, you know, build the team and build the cars. And, you know, we, we had one mechanic um, and, and I, you know, he's, I don't think he's around today, but I, I don't want to name names, but I mean, he was the crew chief that first year. And I mean, he, I came in the shop one morning, he was passed out on the floor. He spent the whole night there and it wasn't because he was working all night. So it was just, you know, this is crazy stuff goes on. Well, appreciate appreciate the answer. Appreciate you spending time with us tonight. So thank you. Hey, no, it was fun. I, I appreciate all you guys uh, getting on the webcast and doing the deal with Rick. And uh, Rick's been really, I mean, I, tell you, I don't know of any 
media guy that just loves racing anymore than Rick. So I appreciate Rick for all what you do also. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, we're going to stick around for a little bit uh, and do some other stuff. We're going to go through an old issue of Sane and also a trivia contest. So if you want to try your hand at some trivia, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to. But, yeah, I understand if you need to uh, take off or whatever. But, Bobby, okay. thank you for your time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, okay, you guys take care. Thank you. Thank All you, man. Buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Everybody, everybody still with me? Yep. All right. Uh, kind of what I want to do now, uh, I, I think you guys know uh, from following the Twitter feed that what we have been trying to do, and, and from day one, this has been the, the goal, it's been the mission. Uh, all these newspapers that you see behind me uh, is, is history. Uh, it is the best record, of, and I really, and I really and truly believe this. The the record behind me, the papers behind me, they represent the best and most complete record of what took place in NASCAR from the spring of 1977 through the end of 2009. And uh, Steve Wade and I met in January of 2018 for the first time to talk about the scene vault and what we could do with it and how we could possibly uh, get permission to make all of them available. Uh, and so what I want to do, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually visited uh, the scene vault website. Uh, Eric Quinn was on the call last week. He's been our, uh, our presenting sponsor for, uh, well, several months now. So uh, Eric, it was actually the one who built the Scene Vault website, and it's scenevault.com. And over on that website, we actually have uh, four complete issues of Scene. So if you get a chance, check that out. Uh, I, I, I would appreciate it if you didn't take screen captures and crop the page out and share all the photos and everything. Brian could probably speak to that. <laughs> but seriously, in all seriousness, that is probably one of the biggest uh, issues standing in the way of the same vault podcast is the copyrights that, that we've got to deal with. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share, um, I'm going to share the scene, the, uh, actually it's the May 7th, 1987 issue of Grand National Scene. Uh, can you guys see it? Can everybody see it? Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go through it and show you what could be possible with the same vault pipe, with the same vault archive, online archive. But as you can see, this was a packed issue. Uh, it was Davy Allison's first career win. Uh, it was the race where uh, Bill Elliott qualified at 212.809 miles an hour. And it was also the race where Bobby Allison wrecked and nearly went into the grandstands. And if that had happened, uh, I don't know that we're sitting here talking to each other tonight. So uh, this is that issue. And I thought it was pretty cool. I didn't realize it until this morning, but this issue day is 33 years ago today. So this is, this is what would be possible with the same. Now, how about, how about Steve Wade? Look at Steve, styling and profiling. <laughs> and here is somebody that has really meant a lot to my career. I never met Joe Whitlock, uh, but I actually saw him in the media center. My very first credentialed race uh, was in April of 1991. I actually saw Joe in the uh, infield media center and I literally could not get up the nerve to speak to him because that was Joe Whitlock and he was honestly I would consider him to be the greatest writer who ever stepped foot in a NASCAR media center so uh, here's a column by Deb Williams uh, I owe my career to Deb and to Steve uh, they were the ones who took a chance on me and hired me and I was a young inexperienced writer uh, working at a weekly newspaper 
uh, with a paid circulation of less than 5,000. And the week after I started at Winston Cup Scene, we went over 100,000 in paid subscribers. So that was definitely uh, a little bit of a culture shock, uh, but it was, de it was definitely pretty cool to get to go to races and have somebody else pay the tab. But this is again, Davey's first win. And so uh, just the artwork, uh, David Schobat was the, uh, the main photographer, the staff photographer at the time. Uh, give you a little bit better look at this. Uh, but the, the work that the writers did and the work that the photographers did, I, I really do believe uh, complemented each other. Uh, this is this is uh, Deb's story on Bobby's wreck, and you can see that that car was really really tore up. And of course, during that race, there was a I guess a two or three hour red flag to repair the fence. Uh, so yeah, this is this is history, folks, and we can't lose it. And the thing that I like about these issues is, yeah, we know that Bill Elliott qualified at 212.809. We know that Bobby Allison wrecked. We know that Davey Allison won. But what we sometimes don't remember are the other people. And as this headline says, Allison's aside, there were other stories to tell. Here's a shot of Richard Petty getting out of his car, Greg Sachs getting in. Uh, here's Harry Gantz wreck. Uh, Ricky Rudd's wreck. So, yeah, there were other stories in that race. So, and then I think next is Bill Elliott's uh, qualifying lead that uh, Steve wrote. And when I talked to Bill, I'll never forget it. When I talked to Bill for the podcast, I asked him about 212.809, and I asked him how fast was too fast. And he said, I don't know that there is such a thing. So he was ready to go faster than 212.809 miles an hour. And I can't, I can't imagine that. Don't know how many of you remember Dan Ford, but we had a section called the photo bio. Uh, Steve Chrisman, there's a feature on him, uh, a, a guy that not a lot of people remember. And that was one of the great things about Grand National Scene. There's old Mike Beam. Here's Derek Cope, uh, well before his Bob Whitcomb and 1990 Daytona 500 days. Pete Wright, photo bio. I know Jerry Kennan remembers him. Uh, here's Bobby Al Here's Bobby Allison, Bobby Hillen, a Miller Genuine Draft uh, ad. Uh, and here's a, here's an interesting interesting story. Uh, a lot of people remember Jeff Bodine. Uh, grabbing a fire extinguisher and helping put out a fire that broke out. And yeah, that's a pretty dramatic photo there. Uh, crew member on the ground, you can actually see the, the flames coming off of him. So uh, this is history. This is details that we can't lose. And uh, if I have anything to do about it, uh, we're not going to. My, one of my favorite sections in the paper uh, was the pit pass section. And it was basically just little nuggets about things that were going on. And every once in a while, quite often actually, as a matter of fact, uh, the pit pass section had some of the best items in the newspaper. Uh, just things that might not have uh, fleshed out into a full story. Uh, but that was one of my favorite sections in the paper. And the rest of the paper, And DK Ulrich. So yeah, that's that's a an old issue, of Grand National Scene. Uh, and I don't know how many of you could uh, imagine having access to that, uh, but that's what we're trying to do. That's one issue. That's one issue of history. And behind me, 
are nearly 2,000 issues. So that is a tremendous amount of history, and we are we are working to make them all available at some point. So uh, that was that. Now the other thing that I wanted to do, uh, we're going to have us we're going to have ourselves a little bit of a trivia question, a trivia contest. So is everybody with me? All right, can y'all hear me? Okay, everybody, thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, everybody can hear me, all right? Now, what I'm gonna do, rather than unmute everybody and the audio getting kind of crappy, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask the question and the first person to answer it correctly in the chat window will get credit for it, all right? I think that would be the fairest way to do this, all right? Now, the person, so you be the first person to answer correctly, that gets you a point. The person with the most number of points at the end of the month will get their choice of either Dell versus Daytona or NASCAR's greatest race. Okay? All right. So let's see how this goes. All right. Question number one. All right. Question number one. How many printings? did Steve Wade's book, Junior Johnson, Brave in Life, go through? Oh, ha, ha, ha. man, you guys are good. Uh, let's see. It looks like Fred Pecky was first. All right, y'all are really, really good. Okay. Second. What is the name of the documentary based on Rick's book, Go Fly? Come on, people! All right. Brian Hallman says, Brian Hallman says, Mission Control, well, Mission, Mission County Toe. Uh, let's see, is that close enough? Yeah, we'll give you credit for that. <laughs> All right. Number three, there are 10, 10 questions, by the way. Number three, why was Kyle Petty mad? when a multi-car accident took place at the end of the 1986 Miller High Life 400 at Richmond. Again, all of these, all of these, okay, all right. Josh Ward, the pool, yes. Okay, number four. Number four, what year did Lake Speed win the World Karting Association World Championship? Ali Emery, 1978, very good. Now the spelling is not gonna, the spelling, I'll, I'll accept basically any, any spelling for this next one. In what country did Lyndon Amick serve with the South Carolina National Guard? Zach Gillespie, Afghanistan. Six, number six, which driver's interview was the first 
to be featured on the Scene Vault podcast. Fred Petke, David Pearson. Very good. Oh, Fred moves into the lead, too. In what year, number seven, in what year was Grand National Scene first published? Fred Pecky, 1977. That's three for Fred. Number eight, who wrote the column, His Flag is Unburnable? Fred, you're really good. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's fair since Fred can type and is a reporter and has made his living typing. So yeah, Fred, you're you're in the lead. All right. What is Steve's nickname for Rick? All right, <laughs> Saskatchewan, Justin, come on, man. <laughs> All right. Fred, Fred's taking a commanding lead. Number 10, who was the crew chief Dell Earnhardt Jr. wanted to fight after being involved in a wreck with Tony Stewart at Pikes Peak in 1998. Oh, I think I've stumped you guys. Let's see. Rambo's not it. Brian Patty's not it. Zippy's not it. Uh, Tony, he was involved in the wreck. All right. Any, any more, any more guesses? What in fat back? I don't believe I'd want a piece of fat back. All right, it was Bryant Frazier. All right, yeah, so it was Bryant Frazier. So um, Fred, uh, you're, you're in the lead uh, and everybody else has one a piece. So uh, I appreciate you guys taking part uh, I'm going to unmute everybody. Um, Y'all have. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. Okay. All right. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Anybody? Uh, if you do, uh, hit me up on chat. Uh, if not, I appreciate you guys being with us tonight. I hope you found it fun. I hope you guys will be back next week. Uh, tell your friends about it. So thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for everything. So we'll see you next week.